it's Louisa Vala and you're watching Gatehouse Insights. On today's episode, I'm joined by Jennifer Petrini, who is QC and President of the Victorian Bar. Jennifer, thank you for taking the time out this morning. It's good to be here, thank you. Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about your career and how it's led, how you've reached senior positions within law? Well, um, it, it, via a very sort of um, circuitous route, um, my, I, there's no lawyers in my family. I come from a family of school teachers. Um, I didn't even do my, my, um, te my schooling in Melbourne. I uh, did my senior school in Adelaide and then came back to Melbourne University. And you know, when it came to applying for jobs in law firms for graduate positions, I thought, oh, how am I going to get a foot in the door? So I put on my resume that I like fishing, because I figure, you know, they, they, you know, a woman that likes fishing back in 1986, or no, sorry, 1980, um, yeah, she must be worth an interview. So it worked. I, I ended up getting articles at Blake's, which is now Ashurst, and um, had a, I had a really good time at Ashurst at Blake's. That they were, it was a real period of growth for them. So they had just taken on the Sydney office. That's how they, from Blake and Regal, they became Blake Dawson. And of course now they're an international firm, Ashurst. Um, but you know, we had a really close group of articles, article clerks. Um, there were six of us and we're all still friends now. So um, it was a, a great time. And I remember uh, a, a guy called Terry Murphy came in to head up the tax practice at Blake's. And I remember on my first day of articles going up to his office and knocking on his door and saying, Mr. Murphy, I would like to do tax law. And uh, the rest they say is history. Um, the only reason I, I left Blake's to come to the bar was that uh, Terry, um, who had been um, seconded from the bar to head up Blake's tax practice, decided to go back to the bar. So I thought, hmm, what am I gonna do? So I thought, well, I can either go to another law firm or I could go to the bar too. And, you know, I had no idea what the bar was. Uh, I had some vague notion of where the Supreme Court was. It was that big building. Um, I'd never been into court. Um, but I was really, really lucky. I, I, when, I, when I came to the bar, uh, I was in the same chambers that Neil Forsyth was in, and Neil Forsyth was the leader of the tax bar in Australia and a lovely fellow. And he mentored me. And one of his junior barristers is a guy called John Devane, who is now, you know, the most senior tax barrister um, in Victoria, I would say. And um, he mentored me as well. So I was very lucky to straight away go under the wings of these two leaders of the bar. And, um, you know, I never looked back. So it was great. And here I am now. So, you know, um, uh, I kept working in tax. Uh, before I knew it, I was basically full-time at the bar. Uh, after I'd been at the bar for three years, I had my first son, James, uh, who's now about to turn 24. And um, two years later, I had my second son, Mark. So um, it, the bar is a, a fabulous place to have children because you, know, you are self-employed um, and it doesn't matter where you work from, so you can work from home. So I found the bar a very rewarding career. Yeah, it's great. Jennifer, did you face any challenges progressing your career? Well, I've always said that the greatest challenge and the greatest reward for me has been having the children. Um, the way I dealt with having children and being self-employed was I would just treat them as my number one client. So if I knew that there was an excursion to the zoo coming up, it would go in the diary as, as an important client conference and that would, you know, it wouldn't be moved. It would be there and I would, I would go off to the excursion with them. Um, obviously you have to be uber organised uh, if you're going to run, a, run your own practice and have children. Uh, and you know, women tend to be really good at being super organised. Um, and I had the blessing of a wonderful husband. So my husband Steve is a partner at Deloitte and he always took an equal share um, as much as he was physically able to in the bringing up of our kids, and still does. So um, I think I think you would have to put that down as, as the number one challenge, but as I say, very rewarding as well. Now, you practice in tax law. Yep. What intrigues you about tax? Well, 
you know, they say you do one thing each day and it scares you and tax fits that bill, you know. Uh, you, you can never say, oh, it's another one of those such and such. Every, every advice, every court case is difficult, it's new. Um, tax law tends not to be about the facts, it tends to be, it's statutory construction. So, it, it, and it tends to be out there in areas that have never been tried before. So what intrigues me is its difficulty. Um, it's it's a, you sort of an intellectual theme park. You know, GST, for example, uh, is incredibly difficult. Um, you, you, I always laugh at constitutional lawyers. You know, they say they're so important, it's so difficult. Well, I'll tell you what, the constitution is this big. Um, the tax law uh, is this big and they change the constitution every, you know, what, 10 years or so? They change the tax law every day. So uh, it is a constant challenge, so that's what intrigues me. And the other, the other half of my practice is, is charity um, law, uh, which dovetails into the tax. So it's getting uh, tax concessions for charitable organisations. So tax deductible, gift recipient status, etc. And, and that's really interesting. You know, the, the law of charity dates back to the statute of Elizabeth in 1601. So, you know, that is, is sort of in contrast to tax, which they change every day. Uh, charity law is, is a, an age old continuum that keeps building and evolving. Um, and the case law about that's really interesting. So there used to be a, a charitable award for good house whiffery, you know, that, you know, that, that you'd be shot now if you had that, that, that sort of an award. But, you know, the charity law changes, which is wonderful. So I enjoy that too. Jennifer, I wanted to touch on, I suppose, building your practice at the bar. What would you suggest to others to build their practice and what's worked well for you? Okay, two things, hard work, networking. So hard work goes without saying really, uh, and managing expectations. So um, you, you, if, if you can't deliver an advice within the time frame that you've said you can, just tell someone and tell them early on. Um, people are really understanding, so work hard, don't ask a question unless you've tried to research it first, um, and put into all those committees. You know, when, when I started at the bar, I was a, a, a member of just about every committee, tax committee known to man, and before it's a tradition when you become president of the bar that you go off all the bar committees, but before that, I was just, I think I was just about on every bar committee. But, but, but that's part of networking. So as a barrister, you're self-employed. Um, and if as a solicitor, you're planning to come to the bar, you can start building your networks right from the word go. Um, the, the thing about mentoring, we'll talk a bit later about that, but it is, you know, Angela, for example, has the, can learn from my mistakes. One of my biggest mistakes when I started is I didn't do networking. So I thought that networking was using your friends and I didn't want to use my friends. And that's not what networking is about. Networking is about just building your business contacts for mutual benefit. Um, so I think if you're going to build a successful career at the bar and indeed in, in the legal profession, two things, hard work and build your networks. Jennifer, what are some other realities people should know about going to the bar? Well, you know, it's the best of the world and it's the worst of the world. Um, there is nothing better than getting that judgment, winning the case, and there's nothing worse than getting the judgment and losing the case. So there's the highs and the lows. But the thing about the bar, and in particular the Victorian bar, is that we are a really collegiate organisation. We, we look after each other. So we have what's called the open door policy. So any barrister, no matter how senior or junior, can knock on another barrister's door and ask for help. And if we, if we possibly got any time, we will help. So, and that's across all the fields of the bar. So um, you are part of an enormous family at the bar and we take uh, at the pastoral care of other barristers very seriously. The bar has a number of um, initiatives in order to be able to look after barristers. If they, you know, it can be stressful, um, and you, you know, there's, there can be uh, 
what might seem like um, bad days where you have a bad judge or something like that, you know, we're there to, to sort of pick you up when you fall over. But, you know, as, as a self-employed person, you know, there's no timesheets, there's no budgets, hallelujah. What's not to love about that? <laughs> Jennifer, I wanted to touch on equitable, equitable briefing within law. In a recent Lawyers Weekly article, you comment that there is still a long way to go before briefing is e equitable in respect of gender. Why is it still so low and what can the legal profession be doing now to change that? It is very low um, in the senior um, courts, uh, in the superior courts. Uh, I think the reason it, it hasn't happened yet is that people are used to doing what they've always done. We're creatures of habit. So if, if the solicitors, the senior solicitors in the big firms, they're always used to briefing Joe Blow. They've always briefed Joe Blow and Joe Blow knows how they operate and they know how Joe Blow operates. And so it's easy, you know, it's like going back to your favorite restaurant, you know, yeah, there's all these other new restaurants out there, but you know, I like, the, I know this one will, will produce a nice meal. Same with barristers. They, they know these older men and it's just a question of them stepping outside their comfort zone. So, so it's a two-way thing. I think that um, female barristers ne need to really work on getting th their name out there and, and doing those sort of things, getting onto committees um, and, and marketing themselves, really. that It, it, it's, it would have never have been thought as, as the barristers as a profession should market themselves back in the old days. But now um, everybody understands that we are self-employed and in order to build our practice, uh, we must get out there into the market so the market knows who we are. So I think, I think there's also a push from clients to, to law firms. So a lot of the clients are themselves women. That doesn't necessarily mean they'll brief women. But um, clients are more aware, I think, of equitable issues. And I, so I think the solicitors are getting a bit of pressure from, from their clients. I think we need to get the more senior silks to um, mentor um, junior women uh, and uh, bring them on in their career. Um, and, and I think once, once people start briefing women, they'll realise that they're just as good, if not better. And you know, the, the public perception that a good barrister slams the table, you know, sort of the LA law type barrister, you know, judges hate that. Um, so aggressive um, um, performances are not welcome by the courts. Um, and, and having said that, you know, women can do that just as well if, if necessary. But um, yeah, I think, I think that women will come on board, but they need to market themselves and I think the solicitors need to, to, to step outside their comfort zone and what they're used to. Jennifer, you touched on something very interesting and that's marketing. What can, I suppose, women and men do to market themselves more? Well, it's the sort of things that, that, that I did when I started and I tell all the junior barristers to do, is to get on committees. You know, it, that seems a very, how, how can that possibly be marketing? Well, you're sitting around a table with the same people who are in your field of expertise and they're seeing you interacting with them so, so they think, oh, you know, she's making some sensible comments. I might call or have a coffee with her or something like that. So there's committee work, writing articles, you know, in, in whatever publication is in your area of expertise. So for me, it's in, you know, the Tax Institute Journal or something like that. Um, and then you have to present at seminars. You, I remember a, a, an old friend of mine once said, you know, it's like a big bucket. You know, you feel like you're constantly tipping into this big bucket and you don't ever get a return from all this work you do. But you do eventually. You know, you, your name is known. So instead of Jennifer Petruni who, I've never heard of her, it's like, oh yeah, Jennifer Petruni. You know, the best female marketer in the legal profession is Fiona McLeod, who's now um, president of the Law Council of Australia and she's been president of our bar and president of the Australian Bar Association. You know, Fiona's name is out there and it's out there because she puts a lot of hard work into, you know, committee work and, you know, um, making submissions, things like that. 
So you'll see her on the news, all sorts of things like that. Now I'm not suggesting that every barrister should get themselves on the news, but that same sort of genre, you know, committee work, um, presentation, and general marketing and networking, again. We like to see it as um, planting seeds in the ground because over time and years of hard work it eventually flourishes. Yeah, it is like that, it is like that. And you'll, ne you'll never sort of see that a, a brief will come in, you know, because I've sat on a committee with you, but, but that is what happens. And then, as you say, it grows. So, you know, once you do a good job on one brief, you know, word of mouth goes round and then, you know, before you know it, you know, you're too busy. <laughs> Which is a good thing. Yeah, well. Hmm. <laughs> Jennifer, where do you see the future of the bar? I see a really bright future for the bar. And it's because barristers as self-employed people are able to be very nimble and agile. So the, the big law firms have this massive overhead um, and you know they've got to cover that overhead before they even start making income. Whereas barristers, at the, particularly at the Victorian Bar, because we provide um, e economical accommodation through our um, property owning arm called Barristers Chambers Limited, so barristers can their overheads can be as small as a thousand dollars a month for a room, and they can have it on a month to month tenancy. And so we're able to move to change. Um, to, to be brought in as experts on, on particular issues. We're seeing more and more that uh, members of the public and indeed corporate solicitors are briefing us directly um, because you, you know, we are experts. We are experts in our subject area and we are expert litigators. Now some big cases of course, you know, like your big bank cases, everything, you know, obviously solicitors um, add an, an enormous value. But sometimes going direct to the bar can be a very economical way of getting good expert legal advice. The sort of young barristers we've got coming to the bar, they've got Oxford Cambridge degrees, you know, they've gone and they've been associates to High Court judges, they've done, um, you know, work in Linklaters in London, and they come to the bar and they're charging out at, you know, very economical charge out rates. And so you're getting a massive amount of expertise for very economical um, charges. So that's why I see the public are going to recognise that and think, oh, we should use the bar more. We should, we should directly go to the bar. Um, and, and the Victorian bar is very user friendly in the sense that we're very open to, to you know, engaging with corporations directly, you know, um, speaking to their um, chairman of their board or whatnot. Um, and you know, instead of just sort of handing down advice from on high, engaging with them, finding out what it is they really want. So I, I see that the, that the bar, particularly the Victorian bar, will flourish in the future. And Jennifer, where do you see your career in the next 20 years? Oh, well, I would like to um, cut down from seven days a week to five days a week. <laughs> that is my aim and I'll get there eventually. <laughs> I do take lots of holidays though, I should say that. So. Yeah, look, it's interesting. Um, I, I'm about to step down from uh, the president of the Victorian Bar and um, I am now the vice president of the Australian Bar Association. So uh, um, that'll keep me busy. And I've just been appointed to the Board of Examiners, which looks at the young students coming through. So, you know, and I will be able to just do what I, you know, my practice, which is just such a lovely practice. I've got very loyal solicitors who constantly brief me. Um, so if I could just keep doing what I'm doing, but do it for five days a week, not seven days a week, that'd be fabulous. <laughs> and Jennifer, before we close, what's some words of wisdom you would share with younger women got coming through their, their legal careers? Work hard and network. <laughs> um, you know, and believe in yourself. You know, uh, it, the, partic the bar can be, um, a, a, you know, a, a place where you get hard knocks. So, you know, you, you think you've done the best you can in a case and you lose it. They say um, at the Victorian bar, uh, or at the bar, I should say, you must have a hide like a, rona, a rhino. <laughs> and when they kick you in the teeth, you must pretend you hadn't noticed. And that's building resilience. So I would say to people, you know, work hard, have your networks and build resilience for, for those times when, you know, when things aren't going so well, 
because um, you are self-employed at the bar and reach out to your friends and to your networks. Um, but yeah, and, and come to the bar. <laughs> it's the best career ever. <laughs> Jennifer, this has been wonderful and thank you for sharing. Thank you, it's lovely. Thanks Louise. Now Jennifer and I would love to hear from you. What is the biggest insight you're taking away from today's conversation? Comment and share below and let us know. If you like this episode, please subscribe to our channels and share this video with your friends. And thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time on Gatehouse Insights.